What's up, family? How y'all doing? It's your girl, your diva in knowledge. Lady Boca, represent Mocha's Cafe de Paris. So I'm always serving you wisdom, knowledge, and spiritual awareness. First of all, I definitely want to start off by saying I have finally reached over a little over 4,000 subscribers. So I am more than grateful for that. I know that may not seem like a big accomplishment compared to a lot of the content creators that have over maybe 50,000 or more in subscribers but for me that's definitely an accomplishment so that further lets me though that um, a lot of you as my subscribers y'all have been doing a darn thing y'all have been liking y'all been sharing y'all subscribing y'all putting people onto my platform and my channel so again I'm very very grateful I appreciate that just thought it was very imperative that I would let y'all know that um y'all definitely looked out for your girl and you got my channel booming um and it's progressing so again I definitely want to thank all of my subscribers who have been with me from day one from the beginning since I started my channel 2017 those of you who have recently subscribed are welcome to Mocha's Cafe Day Paris family and if this is your first time hearing any of my content ever um, please make sure you like and share subscribe if you haven't been getting my videos guys make sure your notifications are set on all and not personalized so, no further ado, I definitely want to begin to get into this particular um, crime lessons in the segment that I'll call because I feel like for every crime, there's always a lesson that can be learned. So, I want to do my content. I thought it was very imperative that I do this particular recipe. When pumping and dumping goes wrong, scoring side chicks, murdering wives, girlfriends. So, um, if y'all don't know, I am a big, big, big fan. Um, Crime advocate, you know, I, I have a strong passion for criminal justice. I've always been into law, which is why um, I did corrections for a while as a correctional officer. So I've always had a fascination with crimes, with law. I've always been addicted to channels like 48 Hours, you know, um, forensic files. Um, but they got a couple of for my man. Then they got it's another one I watch a lot too. Um, and I know the tale to um, love kills and you know different shows that you know talk about um, basically um, relationships or situationships in which it ends up in a tragic situation. So, um, nevertheless, I know I've been owed you guys this content and I haven't been able to upload because I got busy, I got caught up, but I thought this was imperative that I did this particular content because I feel like this is something that a lot of of men and women can learn from um yeah there was a show called scorned love kills i was a big fan of i'm a, still a big fan of these you know criminal documentaries crime shows and things of that nature but um i find situations like this very fascinating i don't know why i'm very fascinated with these type of cases but i find it very interesting um how you have men and women who can get themselves involved in these type of situations and the fact that they allow themselves to get so emotionally involved and they allow lust to overrule common sense that it can end up in such tragic um endings and the truth of the matter is this can happen to anybody none of us are exempt i don't care how educated you are, how smart you are, how attractive you are. Um, anybody is up for grabs when it comes to temptation. And that's why it's very imperative that when you get yourself involved in these type of situations, you understand how it starts, you understand how it begins, you understand the psyche of what the individual is actually going through, um, the mindset, uh, where that person is, is mentally um, you know, when they're getting themselves involved in these type of situations. So nevertheless, I want to talk about this. Now, this is two different situations. So, um, both situations are involving men that are in relationships that already have women already are supposed to be committed. And of course, you know, you have these dudes, you know, who feel like they can have their cake and eat it too. They can, you know, still go out and, and test the waters and at the same time still have that benefit of going back home to their wives, their fiancés, as if nothing has ever happened. Now, when it comes to adultery, when it comes to affairs, I feel like affairs for men is like shopping for women. And just follow me, because when I tell you the analogy is very similar, you're going to be able to marinate 
when I when I give you um I, when I give you the similarities. Just like women when it comes to shopping. Women, we want the best bargain when it comes to shopping. We want something that looks good, but we also want it at a cheap price. You know, um for the most part Regardless, unless you're a millionaire or whatever, most women who shop, we are always looking for the best deal, um, where we can get the best discounts. But at the same time, we want to get a deal, a deal in which something we will like. That's something that's um, close to our preference. So that is the major objective. Whenever a woman is shopping, she wants a bargain, and that bargain has to be something she desires. Because even if it's cheap, even if it's on sale, if it's something that she's not going to wear, she's not going to use, then it's pointless in even buying it. Okay, so even with a cheap deal, there has to be some type of desire for that new dress, for those new earrings, for the new outfit, whatever. And so that's how it is when women were shopping. We're always trying to get a bargain at a good price. But we want to also make sure we benefit from that bargain. What's the use of buying a $20 dress, but it's not your color, it's not your size, it doesn't fit you. It's pointless. But if you can find a dress that at least, if it doesn't have your your color blue for instance if blue is your favorite color you may have to sacrifice and get that black if that's the only one that's left and that's your only size so that's the thing about shopping you want to be able to bargain but at the same time you want to be able to at least make sure it has something that you want something you can work with and i feel like that is the same objective when it comes to men seeking sex um men in most cases they try to get the cheapest bargain they try to get a deal. And um, the reason for this is because, you know, this is something that's just for the moment. It's just a temporary. Um, it's not something they plan on, you know, being consistent with or sticking with. So to me, men are always seeking for the cheapest bid when it comes to looking for a pump and dump. They try to get the best deal. In other words, they try to get a female, um, one who they know they um, don't have to really invest a lot into, you know, that's really initial, that's the initial objective is to find a female, like a woman is looking for a sale, you got to find a female that's willing to sell herself at the cheapest price. Now, we're not talking about prostitution here because that's totally different. Um, the prostitute and the man knows there's no relationship. There's nothing coming behind it. Um, the prostitute knows there's no emotions. She cannot um, look for any type of commitment. It's basically just an exchange. We're not talking about that. We're talking about men who are out here per, uh, pursuing women you know, uh, for their own pleasures. And in many cases, even though they may initially, that's their only objective is to pursue females that they can um, sexually benefit from. The problem is, even though that's their objective, these women, not so much. That is not their main intent. Their intent is to not only get sexually involved with these men but sooner than later they're going they're they're hoping there's something more fulfilling that's going to come out of it later on down the line but truth be told this is how a lot of men have jeopardized um their marriages their freedom um and and and, and in many cases their peace of mind because they're trying to go after the cheapest deal they're trying to look um they're trying to pursue a female who they feel like they could pretty much get over on. They want somebody they can pump and dump. And once they have had too much of it, they want to be able to discard it. Or once they feel like the heat is getting turned up or the missus at home is questioning them too much, riding their coattail, you know, what's going on? You ain't been picking up the phone. You know, your routine is, is different. You're coming home late now, you know, 
you never meet me. You haven't been meeting me for lunch the last two, three weeks. What's going on? So usually in cases when the heat start gets getting turned up, um, now he feels the need to, you know, discard his goodies so he can go back out, go back at home and get in good with his wife because now or his fiance, she's catching on. Um, she's smelling a rat and he knows it. So at this point, he has to abort the mission. However. What a lot of men are not understanding is just because you done got tired of a woman and you have basically gotten everything you needed out of her for your own personal selfish gain, it does not mean you can just discard this woman and just move on happily with your life. It doesn't work that way. So just keep in mind, once you get tired of a woman, once you get tired of having a certain type of woman, that does not mean she's tired of you. You can be tired all you want, but you don't get to dictate that woman's emotions. You don't get to dictate how serious she takes it because, believe it or not, initially in some cases, and this is how a lot of men get fooled, you do have women that will initially get involved with the man, knowing he has a wife, fiance, or is in a serious relationship. And at first, she may give him the indication that she's willing to comply and be the side chick or just have a good time. She initially may, that may be her intent. In the beginning, she may not want a relationship at that point in time. And she may have even lied to herself, telling herself she don't want a relationship, but knowing deep down within she really does. But because she's in a dip drought, and she's not getting the attention she wants. And here it is. It's finally got pursuing her. She'll go ahead and take the bait. But over time, when she's been sexually intimate with this man more than once, they're going places. They're having dinner together. They're, they're spending a lot of time. They're vibing. Eventually, she's going to start catching feelings. I don't care how much she lies to herself and lies to that man in the initial beginning and tells herself, oh, I'm not looking for a relationship. I know you got a woman at home, so I'm not trying to, you know, break your happy home. You know, I'm just want to have a good time. I'm just looking for somebody to kick it and vibe with. But over time, time is everything. When you start putting a lot of time into somebody and especially it's those little special moments. It's not like y'all going to a hotel for like, 30 minutes to an hour, you smash and pass and keep it moving. Y'all actually going places, y'all having dinner, y'all communicating. You know, you're setting this atmosphere for a relationship, even though as a man, you know in your mind that's not your intent. But when you're having these special moments, quality time is everything. When you're constantly in the presence of a woman, um, you're, you're talking to her, you're, you're sharing life experiences, you're giving her advice about things, y'all vibing. Eventually, feelings are going to come into play. I don't care how much you tell yourself as a man, you ain't feeling her like that. You cannot take another woman's emotions. Um, you don't get to navigate how and when a woman should feel for you or not feel for you at all. So nevertheless, we're going to talk about the first situation with your girl Carly Hughes. Now, this was definitely one of those stories that uh, I felt was very, very heartbreaking. I've seen a documentary and I'm going to put it in the link below. Now, anybody who's been following me for a long time, I've discussed this before of the specific case, but I never really... Uh, went into details too strongly about it, but I want to talk about this woman, Carly Hughes. Um, Carly Hughes was a very beautiful woman. Um, she she wasn't somebody that you know uh was unattractive. Um, came from a severe dysfunctional family. Um, she wasn't a, a problematic woman. And this, the problem is that uh, you have men who think they can size a woman up and figure because she looks a certain way or she carries herself a certain way that underneath she's not this psychotic, you know, the psychotic broad, you know, um, that has a lot of mental illnesses, mental issues. So uh, this is the problem. Uh, a lot of men underestimate their opponent. You know, they think because a woman looks a certain way, she carries herself a certain way, that she's not crazy. She's not mentally disturbed. And unfortunately, this is what men I've come to realization to understand is that what a lot of men don't understand is 
the the easier a woman is nine times out of ten there's some type of mental malfunction but in the psyche of most men they don't look that deep into it because for one um they're not trying to look that deep because they're not trying to make anything that deep for one it's not about a relationship for them it's not about trying to get to know that woman to understand that woman so a lot of men don't feel like they got to think that deep and think that far ahead because for one they're not in it for long term they're not really trying to make anything permanent out of it so a lot of guy a lot of men you know you guys are not going to think that deep you're not going to look try to do your thorough research on the female because again you know it's all about smashing and passing you're not trying to make a commitment out of it so therefore you don't feel the need to really look deep before you leap but um in many cases you have these women um that are attractive that seem well put together and they don't always have those obvious red flags where you just know off the muscle um, I better not give this chick no play. You know, I, I don't want to digmatize this chick because I don't need her getting clinging to me like a fabric soft in the sheet. So um, a, a lot of a lot of men, y'all don't look at the red flags. Y'all y'all just look at how the woman looks, and that's unfortunately that that's the curse for a lot of men because y'all you guys are visionary creatures, and you go by how a woman looks rather than learning her character and rather than um asking her certain questions just so you can have an idea of her mindset because right now all it is you're just trying to smash you're trying to get in so um nevertheless we have carla huges here uh who in november of 2006 just to give y'all a little quite quick little summary on the situation in november 2006 just days after thanksgiving Young mother-to-be Avis Banks was found brutally murdered in the garage of Ridgeland, Mississippi home. As authorities scrambled to find clues on what appeared to be a robbery going wrong, the case took a surprising turn. It turned out that her fiancé had his own secrets, which ultimately led to the killer. Avis Banks was the middle child of Fred and Deborah Banks in a family consisting of three daughters. Even as a child, she loved reading and eventually graduated from college in 2001. She studied child development and dreamed of starting a daycare for the underprivileged. In 2004, Avis met Keon Pittman and the two moved in together. After about six months, things got better for Avis after that. At the time of the incident, she was engaged to marry Keon and was five months pregnant. But on November 29, 2006, Keon came home to find Avis unresponsive on the garage floor. A 911 call made by a neighbor around 8.45 p.m. led authorities to the scene. Avis was located next to the car on the driver's side. The 27-year-old had been shot in the head, two in the chest, and one in the leg. In addition, she was stabbed three times and had her throat slit. This appeared to be signs of sexual assault because Avis pulled down his pants but authorities later ruled it out the house appeared ransacked but police believe the scene was staged a shoe print found on the glass door in the home was recovered for further examination police surmised that avis was ambushed in the garage shortly after returning from her daycare job authorities questioned keon about his whereabouts and said he was at basketball practice at the school where he was a basketball coach and teacher since keon was still considered likely suspect the police interviewed his colleagues at the school there they encountered carly huges which was 25 at the time who appeared to be particularly distressed when asked she said she was good friends with keon but authorities soon discovered that this was not the case it turned out that keon was cheating on avis with carla they had been seeing each other since august 2006 while carla eventually admitted to having an affair with keon she did not reveal her full extent to the police they used the school students as uh, they used the school students as messengers, wow, and had even managed to go on vacation for a weekend. Carla, however, claimed that Avis knew of her relationship with Keon. However, no evidence linked Carla or Keon to the murder. That changed when Carla's cousin Patrick Nash came forward with revealing information. Patrick told police that Carla had loaned him a gun and knife to protect himself days before the murder. The weapon was a 38 revolver that he returned some time after Avis was killed. A ballistic examination confirmed that it was the murder weapon. 
Authorities believe Avis was killed sometime between 5.50 and 6 o'clock p.m. that night. While Carla claimed to have been at home the whole time, cell phone records placed her in the vicinity of the crime scene. Carla was tried in October 2009. Keon testified and said that the relationship with Carla was not serious for him, adding there was no long term. It was, it was sexual, caught in the moment, talking about himself. There was never a long term plan with Carla. Keon also said that Carla introduced him to her friends as her future husband and had harassed him and Avis in the past. Additionally, the shoes found at Carla's home matched the shoe print recovered at the crime scene. There had also been blood spatters which matched Avis' blood according to the show. In October 2009, the jury deliberated for eight hours before finding Carla guilty of two counts of capital murder. During the sentencing phase, her father addressed his jury and hoped that she would not be sentenced to death saying, I am not asking you, I'm begging you to spare my daughter's life because as the past has shown, it has been very friendly with many people. She has been very friendly with other people. She's a good person. I just do not get it. I just don't understand everything. That's not her. Ultimately, the jury handed down two life sentences without the possibility of parole. According to prison records, she remains incarcerated at the Central Mississippi Correctional Center for Women in Pearl Rankin county so um as y'all can see um this was a recipe for the disaster um from the beginning so basically carla and keon they both were um school personnel uh she was a teacher and he was a coach at the school so that's how the affair started um so of course you know one thing led to another spending all of this quality time and keon very much already knew he had he was trying to build a future, a life with Avis, his pregnant fiance at the time. They was just getting their lives started. They was getting ready to start a new journey together. They was getting ready to have their first child together. So Avis definitely had no clue, you know, uh, as to what she was in for, you know, why she's here preparing for her new life as a soon to be wife and as a mother. Um, all of that was taken away from her um due to jealousy due to envy and enviousness um due to a woman that had a lot of psychological issues and if you look into the documentary um he keon had no clue what type of mentally disturbed female he was dealing with carla had already been heartbroken by men in her past um the father of her child had abandoned her after they made plans to get married. So he was getting involved with a woman that was already very broken and had a lot of psychological issues. And apparently she never seek counseling. She never got any therapy. Um, after being abandoned by a man she thought was going to potentially be her husband. So you have some women all it takes is one bad negative experiences and it can derail their whole mental. Um, because again, women, we are emotional creatures and some of us, we don't recover in many cases. We don't recover easily from heartbreaks. We don't recover easily from rejection. We don't recover easily from abandonment. Um, these type of experiences, once we encounter these experiences, it scars us for life. It damages our outlook on love on genuinely being loved so in many cases when women experience um these type of issues like abandonment heartbreak rejection it's going to either do one or two things the first thing is it's either going to motivate her um to be even more independent um, to pretty much put all her time and energy into something that's going to distract her from focusing on um, that negative experience that has caused, has left a stain of bitterness in her spirit. She's going to either do that. She's just going to keep striving for better, um, start her own business or putting more time into her children. She's going to basically take that heartbreak and heartache and use it to motivate her to strive for better. Or, in most cases, like Carla, women who have been heartbroken and, and have experienced abandonment and been misused and mistreated, some of them don't take the high road and just learn to take an L and move forward. Many cases, most women, we hold pain hostage. We hold pain hostage to our hearts. And what we do is we harbor 
all of that pain. And what tends to happen is when there's a man that crosses our path, that's willing to deal with us while we're harboring all this pain, while we're harboring all this misery of rejection, things that we never got counseling for, never seek therapy for. While we're in the process of still harboring that pain, and here comes a man, here alone comes a man that's nice to us, that's kind to us, showing us some type of gratitude. In many cases, some of us will take it deeper than what it is because, again, we're still harboring that pain. So any man that shows just a little bit of kindness, we will gravitate towards that so strongly like it's something deep behind it. And again, this is for women that are mentally disturbed, that don't know how to keep their emotions in check and not allow... Um, negative experiences from their past to formulate how they respond to relationships, how they deal with their emotions. Uh, if a woman has not gotten any psychiatric help or spiritual counseling, um, sooner than later, these emotions are going to get the best of her. So again, all it takes is for a guy to cross a path, cross a woman that's harboring pain's path. He's nice. He's kind. He's funny. He's showing attention. She's going to gravitate strongly towards that. And it's one thing for a man just to be nice. But when this man takes it to another level and he's giving you a lot of attention, he's calling you every day, he's sending you text messages, what you're doing, let's have lunch, what you're doing. He's giving you all this attention, something you've been deprived of from past relationships, something you're not used to getting. So all of this is new. It feels good. It feels great to finally have a man that lets you know how beautiful you are, showing you all this interest, showing you all this attention. It's like a new high, a new drug. But then he ups it up a notch by being sexually intimate with you. And if you're not, and, and, and this is the thing, you have some men that know how to give a woman sex and you have other men who know how to give a woman passion. There's a difference. Any man could just climb on top of a woman, you know, hump the hell out of her like a rabbit. You know, he's going and going and going like an energizer bunny. But, you know, that's just sex. But, when it comes to passion, you have men who know how to be passionate, even when it's just sex. There, there's a different language to a woman's body when a man is having sex with her, when a man is being passionate with her. Like I told you about the sex, when a man is just being rough, he's just trying to get it in, he, you know, hump, you know, does his little thing, and then he busts one, and he's done. But a man that's passionate, even though in his mind, it's just sex. But her body language is not receiving the, it as such, even though that, that is what his mind is telling him. But her body is feeling different signals because the sex is passionate. He may be a man that knows that, that just doesn't climb on top of you. And like I said, goes at it. He knows how to kiss you in certain places. He knows how to give you foreplay. He knows how to, he pleasures you. He's soft with his lovemaking. He's gentle. He takes his time. Um, he caresses you. This sends women's, our bodies receive different signals when a man is passionate. It does not matter if he says, you know, um, if, if he, he doesn't have to verbalize it, but in his mind, he's just looking at it like it's just sex. But if this is a woman that's broken and is not used to a man being passionate with her, her body signals are going to amplify and make her mind believe that there is something really deep with this. He know how to kisses her in between her thighs. He knows how to, you know, caress her breasts, rub her back. You know, he he's 
compassionate in his love making. You know, that they're, they're having eye contact. He's cuddling her after they have win a few rounds. He's caressing her. He's holding her in her sleep. He's whispering in her ear. He didn't just bust a few and pull back up his boxers and went on. He's holding you, caressing you. Spending time with you, laying with you the next day. Even though you, we know he's going to be gone a couple of hours, but he's putting all of this time into you while he's there. And in some cases, he takes you out to eat afterwards. He didn't just wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. He still wants to spend time with you. Still making you feel special. When a woman receives these type of wave signals in her body, her mind starts to compute it. And even though, like I said, in his mind, it's nothing deep for him. That's that's just how he does. You have men who can be very passionate, not because they're in love, but you have some men who just enjoy making a woman feel good. They enjoy doing something different with a woman's body that he feels she's never experienced with another man, but that's all it is for him. He can still go home to his wife, back to his life, and not feel anything while this woman is still lying in her bed, reminiscing on everything they did the night before. She's already become intoxicated. And he done already sobered up. He done, he done had him his, his, his few sips and he's good. She's still <laughs> um, sexually drunk. Like I said, she's still intoxicated off of those few nuts that he done helped put a bus. Because the other guys in her past didn't make her climax. Didn't make her feel good. Didn't know how to caress. And 9 times out of 10, this is what Keon did. He knew exactly what he was doing. Now, keep in mind, he wasn't no fine, drop-dead, gorgeous-looking guy. So, I'm quite sure he knew how to compensate. He knew how to charm her, and he knew how to put that black stick magic on her. I guarantee you. You have some guys who know how to compensate where they're lacking. They know if they don't have a lot of money, they know to put it, make it good with that wood. They know if they're not top notch, you know, handsome, they know how to turn up that charm, put a little volume on that charm. You have men who know how to compensate what they are lacking. And a woman who does not have any confidence, who does not have any self worth, it does not take much for men like Keon. To turn them out. Now don't get me wrong. He's an alright looking guy. But not fine enough. Well I don't know no man fine enough really. To where you become so infatuated with them. You're willing to kill. His wife. I mean his fiance. Because you're just that broken. You're just that hurt. That you know in your mind. She knew in her mind, no matter how hard she held on to him, that she was never really going to have him. She knew that. But what she kept assuming, like most females in this type of situation, well, you know, as long as I keep giving him some, as long as I keep spending time with him. He'll see that I'm different. He'll see that I'm worth it. As long as I keep giving him some head, as long as I keep sexually pleasing him. A lot of women keep manipulating themselves, lying to themselves, making themselves believe as long as they keep putting more of themselves out there, eventually they're going to get what they're seeking in return, only to find out they don't get anything. That he's still going to be with this other woman, and this was a bit, and this is pretty much what happened. Um, Carly Hughes 
she was aware that Keon Pittman was already in a committed relationship with Thavis. And despite all of that, she felt like the more she kept sleeping with this man, that eventually he will give in. And women, they, they, we, we just, it never clicks that just because you keep giving a man your body, it does not mean you're eventually going to win them over. I don't care if he calls your name. I don't care if you have him speaking in tongues. It's, it's never going to be enough for him to get to that point of where I'm just going to leave my wife. I'm just going to leave my woman. Now, in some cases it happens, but in most cases it doesn't. Because in his mind, he has already decided this is the woman he's going to be with. But if you're down for the ride and you want to have a good time and enjoy it for what it is, you know, that's all it's going to be. But again, this is where men play themselves because um, a lot, you have some of these women, depending on how mentally disturbed she is, she's not going to go down without a fight. She's not going to take that L. She's not going to take that rejection. She's not going to take um, that, that as a champ and keep it moving. If anything, that heartbreak, if it eats her up enough, she's going to react on it. And she knows, I'm going to have to do something. I can't let this guy think it was cool for him to lay me, play me, betray me, and keep on moving like I was garbage. Not when all these nights we was making hot, passionate sex. And now he wants to discard me like I'm yesterday's trash. So what provoked Carla to kill his pregnant fiance? Why did she not go after him? Why did she not kill herself? We're going to discuss that further until I'm... Done speaking on this other case. We have another similar case. Shannon Crowley and Jermaine Strawn. Fatal Attraction. Yeah, that was the other show I meant to tell y'all that I'm also a fan of. Um, the murder of Danita Smith by Shannon Crawley in the state of North Carolina. The love story of Jameer Strahd and Danita Smith does not end well for Danita Smith. Danita Smith. Jameer had previously dated Shannon, who did not handle his rejection well. He had not been serious about her, and when he proposed to Danita, it pushed her over the edge. She further tried to destroy him by insisting it was him who had committed the murder and produced tape recordings that were alleged to be him threatening her. However, they sounded nothing like his voice. Shannon Crowley was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole and is not eligible for release. At approximately 8.10 a.m. on July, no, I'm sorry, on January 4, 2007, Michael Hedpedge, the maintenance director for the Campus Crossings Apartments, Heard a shot fired and saw a woman running from the back to the front of the building of the complex. Mr. Hedgepath testified that the woman's route was unusual one because there was a more convenient exit to the parking lot. As, Myth, as Mr. Hedgepath drove toward the 111 building, he saw a young woman, possibly the same woman as before, driving away from the building in a burgundy SUV. Mr. Hethpedge testified the young woman was hysterical about the gunshot. She told him it was because she was afraid of guns. The young woman told Mr. Hethpedge she stayed at the 1200 building, so he told her to go wait for him there while he called the police. Mr. Hethpedge saw the young woman in the SUV once more in the parking lot of Campus Crossings while he was on the phone with police but did not see her after that. Police arrived at Campus Crossings in response to Mr. Hethpedge's 911 call, but they left without filing a report because they were unable to assert the source of the gunshot. At approximately 10 a.m. that morning, Corby Smith, the Campus Crossings resident, was coming out of his apartment to go to work when he saw someone's belongings scattered down the staircase. 
At first, he thought someone did not make it up the stairs for some reasons, but at the bottom of the stairs, he discovered a body. After seeing that the body was not breathing, Mr. Smith called 911 on his cell phone. Based on instructions from the 911 operator, he checked a purse on the stairs for identification and found out it was a body of Danita Smith, a campus crossing residence and student pursuing a master's degree at North Carolina Central University. Mr. Smith then went to the clubhouse at the campus crossings to notify Mr. Hefpedge. So, while Danita Smith is dead and Shannon Crawley is serving life without, there are lessons here for anyone willing to it a thought with some men there are women they will marry and women that they will only ever have sex with. Avoid men like this since they have zero issues using another human being for sexual release since they frequently will make false promises in order to have sex. They are insecure despite being charismatic <laughs> Shannon still has crazy eyes to this day and should probably be considering changing her name so um this was a very interesting story as well um Shannon Crowley uh, was dealing with um Jer Jer uh, Mr. Straw uh, yeah Jameer Jameer Straw that's his name um they was having an ongoing fling affair and he underestimated her because she was young she seemed simple and he figured because he was a, a police officer and he was too smart for his own good. Again, as I stated, you have a lot of men who underestimate their opponent. Um, and he figured he found him a cheap bargain um, only to find out that this woman was not going to get past him just pumping and dumping her. So um, she actually went after his fiance. So I'm reading another article here and it further says... Um, by all accounts, Danita Smith was a beautiful African-American woman who many described as intelligent on top of her game. Danita had planned to marry Jermere Strahd, a man who was also described as intelligent and charming. It seemed that Danita Monique Smith had everything going in her favor, but behind the scenes, investigators learned that her fiance, Jermere, had a secret. He was having sex with another beautiful woman named Shannon Crawley, a local 911 dispatcher at the same police department where Jermare worked. So she was a 911 dispatcher, y'all, and he was working in the police department. So this is how they ended up hooking up um, and getting to know each other and deal with each other. While Danita Smith was trying to make life perfect for them, Shannon Crawley was plotting a way to take Jermare from Danita. That all had come to a head when Shannon Crawley saw Danita with Jermare for the first time as they walked into the church. Hand in hand. So this chick was so infatuated with him. She started going to their church. And that's when things totally derailed. When he, when she was sitting in the back of the church. And saw Jameer and um, Danita walking in the church. Holding hands together as a couple. It fumed her. It, it went left from there. It was then that Shannon Crawley decided that she wanted her rival dead. Uh, NBC would trace how Danita Smith was found lying unconscious at the bottom, unconscious at the bottom of the stairs at an apartment complex. In January 2007, at first it appeared that the young woman had taken a nasty fall, but when investigators arrived on the scene, they found out the victim had a gunshot wound to the back of her head. She had been shot execution style. Detectives interviewed as many people as possible to see if anyone saw what happened. Only a few people remembered that they heard a big bang, but admitted that it sounded like garbage tops pounding together. Uh, but that was when the maintenance man at the building had reported to 911 he believed gunshots were fired. He also told believes that he saw a black woman crying and running away from the building. Uh, police didn't find Danita's body when it came out the first time because police searched out in one building, not knowing that Danita was lying dead at the back of an opposite building. Law enforcement officials eventually learned from Danita's fiance, Jermere Stroud, Stroud, that he had been having problems with a woman named Shannon Crawley. Shannon Crawley had become so obsessed with Jameer and so enraged with Danita that she had obtained a gun and waited for her to leave her apartment. When Danita finally emerged from her apartment, Shannon Crawley fired two shots, one hitting Danita dead center in the back of her head. Danita Smith's devastated family members couldn't believe that it had all ended this way, but they were able to get some measure of justice when Shannon Crawley was finally convicted in her death. As for Jameer Strahd, Investigators said that he had no part in Shannon's plan to kill Danita, but they all agreed that if he hadn't had that affair with Shannon, Danita would be alive today. So, um, nevertheless, we all could already, we know the, the main, 
more of the story here. He was smashing this female for his own personal gain, knowing he already was in a committed relationship. And he thought, now that he's tired, he done had all his fun. He done had enough of her. He's ready to go back home and lock in with his wife, with his soon-to-be wife at that time. And again, that's what's his mindset. But what a lot of men are not understanding is you cannot control the mindset of the other woman. You cannot control how she thinks. You cannot control how she feels. And regardless of, even if you verbally tell her up front, even if she agrees, even if she acts like she does not mind being a side chick, keep in mind you're taking a gamble because she may feel that way for this moment, but depending on how damaged she is, depending on how many men have used her, neglected her, and disrespected her, the moment you decide to jump ship, all of those old harboring, bitter, angry emotions are going to reset in the back of her mind. They're going to, they're going to replay. And she's going to have a flashback. And all of a sudden, you're going to see a whole nother side of this chick that you never imagined. So it boils down to the main steak and potatoes of this content. What drives these women? What drove Carla Hughes to kill Avis Banks, who had absolutely nothing to do with Keon? After all, Keon was the one that was smashing her, right? Same thing. What would make Shannon Crawley kill Danetta Smith instead of killing Jameer Straw? What provoked these women to kill the other woman instead of the man? It's nothing deep. The answer is more simple than we can conclude. It was basically about destroying what he loved. This Because women, we deal with things most of the time... Women, we make decisions based off emotions instead of logics. Since he didn't love me, and I loved him, I'm going to kill something he loves. What made them choose the woman instead of man? Because the woman is more vulnerable. These they they these women, Carla and Shannon, they knew these women had no clue what these what their men was putting them through. So it was easy for them to become prey to their targets. These, these women was totally defenseless. And these side chicks knew that. And the main thing what it boiled down to was they wanted to destroy these men the way they felt these men destroyed them. Now, I know you're saying mocha, but that makes no sense. Yes, these men destroyed them, but they didn't kill them. So, it still doesn't balance out. They they, they, they actually took these women's lives. So, that, that's a whole different level of destroying of being destroyed and I get it but you again you will never understand the psyche of a damaged woman these women wanted these men to hurt in the worst way possible so what better way to destroy a man take away something that he values And these women knew how much these men value their wives, our fiancés. Now, I know it's strange when I say value because, again, Mocha, what you mean? Evidently, they didn't value them because they stepped out on them. They was having affairs on them. I get it. I agree. But at the end of the day, these are the women they wanted to be with. Now, was they wrong for stepping out on them? 
Absolutely. Was they wrong for manipulating these women? Knowing they wasn't going to be with them? Absolutely. And, and this is the very reason why it ended up costing them. Well, men have to understand anything that's too easy and too cheap is going to be more expensive later. Just because it's easy, that don't mean to jump on it. Just because it's a quick sale, a cheap bargain, some bargains you got to turn down. Because it's going to come with a whole lot. It's going to cost you way more. It's cheap right now, but it's going to cost you a lot later. It's going to cost you a lot of peace. It's going to cost you money by the time you have to pay for lawyers. By the time you have to pay for funeral experiences, it's ex expenses. And the fact that these men both have to live with the fact that the women who died behind their lust, their families are going to forever resent them. And both of these men admitted that they know had they never messed with these women, they would have still had their fiancés. Both of them have admitted that. Keon, Ke Keon admitted it, and so did Jameer. They both said it during their court hearings, coincidentally. Now, the crazy part, Ken, 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 he had an opportunity to walk away. He had actually already had stopped dealing with um, Carla for a couple of months. So slowly but surely, she was getting the picture. She was getting used to him not coming around. But she called him one more time, and he took the bait. And it started all over again. So he was almost on his way out the cliff. But he went back and smashed one more time. And now one last time costing him. Being greedy. He was already wrong for stepping out there. But you being greedy, you kept going back. So this woman was so broken and, and, and dismantled and torn apart by Ken not wanting her. She actually went to his home and killed his wife. And that was an overkill. She shot her and stabbed her. Did this woman wanted his fiance gone? Uh, and it, it all boils down to displaced anger. You, they, they couldn't make the men hurt like they were hurting. So they hurt someone who they knew meant something to the men. That was an overkill. She, she not only shot a pregnant woman, she stabbed her. Multiple times, overkill. For every stab she was penetrating through that woman was her hate for Ken. That's not who she was really mad with. She was mad with Ken. But since Ken didn't care about her, she was going to show him, I don't care about what you got either. And the fact that that woman was getting ready to bear his child, she really wanted to destroy him. I'm going to take your life, your soon-to-be wife, and your child. Same thing with Shannon Crawley. She followed this woman to an apartment complex. Overkill. Exe Anytime you hear of an execution, uh, execution shooting, somebody's been shot in the back of the head, that's personal. So, we have both of these women, two totally different situations. But the outcome became the same, basically because you had these men being greedy. They wanted to have their cake and eat it too. And they thought they was going to smash and pash. Pump and dump. Stick it and kick it. Beat it and leave it.
And these women wasn't going for that. These were women who already evidently had psychological issues because uh, women, all of us experienced at some point in time getting played, getting cheated on, but we didn't resort to going after nobody's wives or fiance and killing them and murdering them. But this is the thing, men, what you have to realize, you could be smashing somebody that's psychologically damaged, mentally ma dysfunctional, have a mental malfunction. I don't care how beautiful and pretty she is. You don't know what you're laying with. You don't know what you're penetrating. You could be penetrating a woman that has abandonment issues. So, what ended up happening in the long run? Well, starting with Mr. Keon Pittman, he has remarried since then. He has remarried since then. He has a new wife and a new life. He lives in a different state, has been married since 2007 to a woman from Detroit. Where's Carly Hughes today? She is serving two consecutive sentences of life without parole at the Central Mississippi Correctional Facility near Pearl, Mississippi. All of that to destroy him, and she ended up destroying herself. Keep in mind, Carly Hugh just does have a son who is now grown, who was a child when his mother got sentenced. So she will never, ever have the luxury of going to her son's first wedding, seeing her first grandchild. All of that is ruined over a, a moment of passion. In in the, in, the, in the what the movie A Thin Line Between Love and Hate when the mother said one night of passion could cause a lifetime of pain and that's exactly what happened it that could have been a more truer statement she did all of that to keep him and still ended up losing him this man still moved on with his life now why the family Avis's family is still damaged, still healing, and I know they still have a lot of resentment against Keon because they know his actions are the reason their daughter is dead, but even they have found the grace to move on. So Carla did all of this only for these people to eventually move on with their lives heal, and, and however the struggle, how deep the struggle is, and they moved on while she's in prison, and her life was gone. Same thing with Shannon Crawley. Now, I looked up Shannon Crawley's, um, I looked up her record, and I found it ironic that, um, she has been in, I'll say, probably two to three physical fights since she's been incarcerated. <laughs> Which proves this young woman has always been combative. Always been drama. Always had issues. He was sticking a nutcase and had no clue. He also has moved on. He's remarried. He's had children because he's always wanted children. And despite losing his fiance through his actions, he was still able to move on with his life. He's still a police officer. I looked up his Facebook page. He still has a beautiful wife. He has a child that looks just like him. He moved on. He still has his career. And he seems like, from what I could perceive, you know, that he's learned from his mistakes, hopefully. Hopefully he has learned and didn't take this other woman through what he took Danita, Danita Smith through. So maybe he has learned, you know, a piece of pie ain't worth the drama that comes behind it. So maybe his current wife got blessed and didn't have to feel, got, didn't have to endure that heartache. And the truth is, you know, um... A lot of men who do end up getting married, having families, and, and moving on, nine times out of ten, they done bought a lot of bridges. They done did a lot of women in before they got to that place. 
Even if you're a married woman, trust and believe your husband has done a lot of women in before he got with you. And, you know, we go through the immaturity. We go through being young and dumb and taking risk. We all experience that. But at some point, we learn to move on and better ourselves and to take a different approach in life. And it's unfortunate that these women didn't apply that same method because who's to say how God could have blessed them? Who's to say? Carla Hughes and Shannon Crowley, they both was beautiful women. Who's to say that they couldn't have moved on, still got husbands, still ended up having children? Who's to say they still couldn't have had a successful future? But because they became so infatuated with men that were using them. And as the saying goes, if a man is dealing with you while he's in a relationship, what makes you think he's not going to do the same thing with you? But these women were such damaged goods, they couldn't see past the moment. They went all the way in. They became so obsessed with these men. And they loved these men more than they loved themselves. In fact, they loved somebody else's man more than they loved themselves. Because whenever you love somebody more than you love you, you are willing to compromise your own self. Meaning you're willing to compromise your future. You're willing to compromise your, your freedom. You're willing to compromise your worth. You are willing to lose anything to be with them. And that is what happened. Now, ironically, both of these women have tried to appeal. And usually that's what happens for first timers when they go to prison for the first time. And they've never been locked up before. And they realize the prison life is not all that glamorous. They realize years and years and years have passed. I'm never going to get the hell out of here. I realize this is my final resting place. I want to try to appeal. Both of these women have tried to appeal and neither one have been successful. They're done. Now reality has sunk in. I'm here for life. And I'm sure they probably got the word because in prison, um, in jail, you do have access to internet. You do have access to computer. I'm sure they probably know. I'm sure they're aware if a family member, someone has told them that they're the dude they was obsessing over has moved on to be remarried. I'm sure they know. Now they see it's not worth it. Usually when a person appeals, it's either because they're still in denial that they really didn't do wrong or they realize, damn, I shouldn't even be here. But it's too late. And these, neither one of these ladies both have exhausted their appeals. Shannon Crowley has still had several issues since her incarceration. Carly Hughes, which was a very beautiful, attractive woman, she looks terrible. She just like life just done beat her down since she's been incarcerated. So that love she was looking for, she's never going to get. At least not in the free world. But this is what happens when, um, again, when you have women... That becomes so infatuated with men after they have been pumped and dumped. And because they're not woman enough to deal with the pain, they're not woman enough or, or mentally stable enough to accept the fact, this this dude played me. He, sh he, he, he shysted me. He got me. He got a one up on me. Okay, it's cool. I'm going to take this L, but this is going to be the last time I put myself in this position. No, they actually murdered the the women that was connected to these men because it's all about destroying the man but in process in turn they ended up destroying themselves so anyway y'all leave y'all comment below let me know what y'all think about the situation when pumping and dumping goes wrong um scoring side chicks murdering fiancés wives baby mama because a man sold them a dream that has never came true these women Still had a chance of moving on and possibly ended up with something better. But then again, if their psyche was already this damaged, they probably would have did something. If not this, it would have been something else. Because again, all, all of us have experienced getting betrayed, getting played and cheated on. But for you to resort to having to murder somebody... That is a whole nother psyche, psychological um, damaging spirit that 
has unfortunately has taken over the mindset of these women and have caused them to be in a situation where they are. They're never getting out of prison. Um, the men who they were so infatuated with and killed their fiancés over, both are remarried. Both have moved on with their lives. Honey, y'all got to be so careful as women. Really look past the moment. I don't care how infatuated you are right now. I don't care how hurt you are. I don't care how much pain you are in. Really, really look deep before you leap and you make a decision that could cost you a life. And men, stop smashing these chicks. Again, you don't know their mindset. You don't know if the woman that you really love, you come home to every night, you kissing up on, you hugging, you in love with. You don't know if this woman can lose her life behind your actions. So anyway, y'all, it is your girl, your diva, and knowledge. Lady Mocha, represent Mocha's Cafe. They're powerful. So I'm always serving you with some knowledge and spiritual awareness. Please make sure you hit that like button before you leave. I'm going to leave the documentaries, the links to both of these women below in the comment section. So you can um, look more into the situation because way more details. But I, I didn't have to. I didn't want to overly try to cover everything because it just would have made the content even longer than what it already is and we're a little over an hour so anyway y'all y'all be blessed take care signing off